Hey everyone, my name is Paul Reese, and I'm a Developer Programs Engineer on Firebase at Google. We're excited to be able to support GoCode Colorado this year, as you all build out awesome projects to solve business problems using public data. I'll be around throughout the event to help with any questions that you have around Firebase, and we're also adding some more information over at gocode.colorado.gov. Good luck to all of you, and we'll see you around. Today we're going to talk about two tools, Flutter and Firebase, and how they can be used for rapid prototyping. So whether it's at a hackathon like this one, with only one weekend to build something presentable, or you have an idea for an app that you really want to test out before you invest in it, a lot of us have been in a situation where we want to build something that gets the job done quickly. During the normal prototype development process, developers plan out what their app should do and how it should function, research the feasibility of the idea, map out their architecture, pick their tools, and then build a clean and organized prototype, right? Yeah, so no. <laughs> uh, some people stick to a very formal process, but when building out a quick prototype or proof of concept app, most of us, myself included, just want to open up an IDE and start coding, and then we'll just kind of figure it out as we go along. So given this, I'm going to talk about the two tools that I mentioned earlier, Flutter and Firebase, both of which address different development problems. Flutter is for client-side development, and Firebase is for the backend. These tools are designed to be easy to use, and they are well supported with content and documentation to make getting up and running as quick as possible. So while I wouldn't say this is necessarily a deep dive, this presentation is going to look at a lot of code and tools that will hopefully be helpful in getting you started with Flutter and Firebase. While it might be a lot up front, I can't stress enough that you don't need to memorize everything. What I hope to do with this talk is help you leave with the vocabulary to look into both of these tools further when you're ready to use them. The link for this talk will also be going out afterwards, so you should be able to reference back to the slides. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. First, let's talk about Flutter. It's a UI toolkit that uses the Dart programming language for building native apps for multiple platforms on top of C++ using a 2D engine called Skia, which is the same graphical engine used by Chrome, Android, and a few other platforms, all from a single SDK. Since everything is built from a single code base, you can create your prototypes for multiple systems, such as Android or iOS, without requiring specific developer knowledge about each platform. Flutter is also completely open sourced. Not only is Google working on it, but so are many members of the developer community. Rather than being walled off from the internal workings of the tool, you can dig into the code to see exactly how Flutter is doing what it's doing, as well as send your own pull request if you want to improve it. So far, there's been about 20,000 contributions from the developer community into Flutter, with 100,000 stars on the repo, and that number keeps rising as more people discover and try the platform. So aside from Flutter being cross-platform, you're probably wondering when you should use it for rapid prototyping, especially since other tools exist that do similar things. Like most development decisions, the answer is basically, it depends. While Flutter isn't the only tool that can work cross-platform, it is designed from the ground up specifically for creating apps quickly. It's able to easily tie into device hardware using external plugins and packages that can be imported into your project, and uses widgets, which we'll dig into a bit more soon, to create UI components programmatically rather than requiring something like a layout file or storyboard. One other feature of Flutter that I think is super valuable is hot reloading, so you don't need to restart your entire app to test small UI changes. Instead, UI changes will automatically be applied in your running app as you change various values. Following up on the it depends answer, there's also going to be times when Flutter isn't the right solution for you, and it's better to figure that out early on in the development process. For starters, games are a lot of fun to develop, but Flutter just isn't really at a point where you can make most types of games quick enough to call it a rapid prototype. You'll need to rewrite a lot of components from scratch that other platforms currently give you out of the box. Additionally, calling native APIs directly just isn't super easy. Normally you would write native Swift or Kotlin, and then use platform channels to communicate back and forth to the native level through a bridging process. While this isn't necessarily a deal breaker, it is more work than just throwing some UI together and calling it good. The next thing to consider is audio support, or rather, the lack thereof. So while audio isn't supported by native widgets, there are third-party plugins out there that can provide this functionality. Which brings me to my next point. While there's a ton of plugins for Flutter, some third-party libraries that developers have grown to love just aren't really available right now. Um, so you'll have to weigh the necessity of things like that versus working with what Flutter has before deciding to use the tool. Fortunately, there's actually alternatives for most things, but we'll kind of dig into that a bit more later. Finally, Flutter doesn't really have support for additional form factors like watches, televisions, and cars. So right now, Flutter has very limited support for Wear OS, but no support for things like TV OS. 
So like we've talked about already, one of the biggest draws to Flutter for rapid prototyping is that it's an easy to use tool for creating custom UIs. The first part of this presentation is where this talk starts to get into the technical side of things, as I want to give an overview of some of the ways Flutter can be used to build UIs. When you're working with Flutter, everything is a widget, and all UI is described by widgets in a tree structure. One key term that you'll see in Flutter documentation around this is aggressive composition, which essentially just means that aside from some very basic components, the widgets that you use in your app, either custom ones that you put together or that come built into the platform, will be made up of other widgets. So you can think of them like Lego bricks, where you just connect them together to build whatever you want. So while there are hundreds of widgets, I want to go over just a few of them at a high level to give you an idea of this fundamental part of Flutter. As a lot of you know, you can't really start with anything in the software world without Hello World, right? So let's take a look at this example to get an idea of how Flutter uses widgets to create bare bones user interfaces. All Dart apps use the main function as their entry point, and in there you can initialize various components and start your Flutter application. You can also see a sender widget in this example, which will center your content in the middle of the device screen. Next up is a text widget that, as you can probably guess, is going to show some text. This text widget also has a few properties that can be applied to it. The first one is the string that will be displayed by the text widget, and the second is a named optional property called text direction that can be used to customize the widget. All said and done, you'll end up with this stunning example of a beautiful, simple user interface that does almost nothing. So before we really get into how to use some useful, common widgets, I want to divert for a moment to touch on how Flutter can be used on multiple platforms. We've all seen apps made with multi-platform tools, but they just don't look quite right compared to the system standard UI, such as Android apps that look like they were designed for iOS. What makes Flutter handy here is that it's able to tell what platform it's on so that you can apply the proper UI elements for your app based on the OS. You can see in this example that we're using the same app on both iOS and Android devices, but they each look native to their respective platforms. This functionality is available through the Dart IO package that can be imported into your apps. When the user is on iOS, the platform.isiOS flag will be true. If the user is on a different OS, then that flag will come through as false. You can also see that we're using a standard ternary statement here to expand the proper widget for whatever platform the user is on. After you've checked that flag, you can extend an iOS-specific Cupertino widget to have it look like a native component when on Apple devices. For this example, we'll take a look at using an iOS-styled slider from that Cupertino package. You will need to make sure that you import the Cupertino Dart package into your app in order to have this styled widget. If the user isn't on an iOS device, then you can just expand a regular slider as a part of the second option in the ternary operation. Finally, you can see that both of these sliders have properties that can be set on them. While the base properties are the same in this incomplete example, there are some differences in the components, such as a background color property that only applies to the regular slider. You'll want to check documentation or the source whenever you use a platform-specific component to make sure you're setting the correct attributes rather than assuming they're always going to be the same. Since that last slide, for the sake of space, use an incomplete code sample, I've included a complete sample for a slider here for everyone. The value for the slider is a double that is saved outside of the widget. The active and inactive colors are set for the material design version of the widget, and the onChange property is set to maintain state as the slider is used. One thing to pay attention to is that if the onChange property isn't set, then the slider is unusable. Like a lot of things in Flutter, this widget is pretty straightforward, but you will need to look through the source or documentation to understand why certain properties are needed or what they do. The next component that I want to talk about is the list, since honestly, most apps are essentially just list and detail screens. There's actually a lot that you can do with lists, like setting them up for infinite scrolling, having items react to long presses, and adding various custom widgets that each do different things. To keep everything simple for this example, we'll start by just looking at the code for a super basic list of generated text items with a circle icon. After that, we'll take a moment to look at adding a swipe to dismiss feature to our list, similar to what you see in this demo image. If you're coming from the Android world of recycler views, you'll hopefully be surprised by how simple this is, especially in comparison to how Android uses the standard view holder pattern and decorators. The first widget here is the scroll bar. While it's not necessary, it does provide, as you can probably guess, a scroll bar on the side of a list so users know how far along in the data they are. After that is the actual list view widget, which provides the scrollable area that contains and controls the list items. This widget also has a collection of properties that can be set to customize the list. So here you can see that we're setting a padding at the top and bottom of the list view, that the only required property is the children's array, which will house the items that exist inside of this list. The next part is where this component gets a little bit more interesting. 
While you can include a simple list or array data structure of other widgets, there's also this great list.generate call that can loop a set number of times to create widgets for your list view. So in this case, we'll simply create 100 items that will be displayed in our app. Each of those 100 items will be made up of a single list tile widget, which implements the material design spec for list items for you out of the box and is generally used to display some text and a leading item, like an icon, for each list item. And as you might expect, this list tile has its own properties. The first one is the Exclude Semantics widget, which wraps a circle avatar. This will display the index from the generated list as an icon at the start of the list item, and since it's wrapped by the Exclude Semantics widget, it won't be read by accessibility tools like screen readers, meaning it doesn't add noise for users that need to use these tools. It's worth noting that this Exclude Semantics widget should be used really sparingly, and only when there's a very specific and beneficial reason to get around accessibility tools. The final part of the list tile widget in our list view is probably the most simple. It's just a single string in a text widget that represents the content of our list item. While that wasn't very much code, it does create a simple list view for our Flutter app. I actually have that exact code running in this graphic, but I also modified it to include a swipe to dismiss feature so we can talk about how you could add something like that to your prototypes. So let's go ahead and dig into that now. The core of this functionality is yet another widget, and in this case, it's a dismissible. What's nice about this is that we don't need to replace anything in our current list to make swipe to dismiss work. The dismissable widget just takes the list tile widget from our last section and adds it as its own child. If we ran our app at this point, each item in the list view would be swipeable and would also be removed from the list view if completely swiped off the screen. While optional, the background property does help let users know when they are swiping away on an item by changing what appears behind the list item during the action. So in this case, I'm adding a new container widget that sets the background color to a very light green. You can also set a secondary background color if you want the user to see a different background when swiping to the left versus the right. One thing that's worth noting here is that since the background property accepts any widget, you can do some fun and interesting things in this area, like loading in an animated GIF for the list item's background. While that doesn't necessarily mean you should, it is fun when you're trying to just play with things and see what you're going to be able to do with that list. Now that we've looked at what we can do with the background of a dismissible, let's get into a couple more properties. The first is key. This is a required property that needs a unique value to keep things in order while removing items from your list, as it interacts with the actual data driving the UI. To keep things simple, you can usually just use Flutter's unique key class to assign a unique key to your dismissible list item. Finally, there's the onDismiss callback. While this isn't required by the dismissible, it is useful when you want to display something to your user to let them know that they have removed an item from their list. This is also where you would notify your backend that an item was removed if it's hosted remotely. That way it doesn't show back up for your user the next time they open your app. Since they're fairly often the widgets that are actually used in list views, let's wrap up our general discussion of widgets by briefly talking about the card's design pattern. Like most widgets in Flutter, this snippet is pretty lean. The size box means each card will have a predefined height, and that size box will wrap a child card widget, which sets some general properties for the card, like the shape and basic behaviors. Next up is the child of that child, which in this case is an inkwell. The inkwell is kind of an interesting widget as it's what the card uses to figure out interactive touch areas. You can also set a touch area color, such as the ripple effect in Android, by setting the splash and highlight color. If you don't want these to show up, then you can set these properties to color.transparent. Finally, that inkwell has its own child, which is the actual content of the card that the user sees. In this example, it's a custom composite widget called Travel Destination Content. Despite the complexity of the widget that we've abstracted away here, you can see that you can add any sort of widgets that you want to your cards. Overall, this snippet is just a great example of how Flutter uses a hierarchy of widgets to build a UI for your users. So, so far we've covered a handful of widgets, but we haven't even broken the surface on how many are actually out there. To learn more, I really recommend checking out the Google Developers YouTube channel to find the Widgets of the Week videos, and to check out the official widget reference documentation at flutter.dev. So now that we've covered a handful of common widgets, let's get into some stuff that's a little more interesting and useful when it comes to learning the platform quickly and creating some prototypes. The first tool that's awesome for getting up and running quickly is the Flutter Gallery app. This app is entirely open source and available on GitHub, meaning you can grab whatever functionality you like out of it to throw into your prototypes. It goes over a collection of widgets that you can use with both Material and Cupertino stylings, and has a lot of other useful features that you can mess around with in this Playground app. Each widget section in the Gallery app 
includes a descriptor, and can bring up the code that was used to create that section. Each widget page also has an icon at the top that will take you directly to the official documentation for the widget that you're looking at. Additionally, there's a variety of tools that can show you how to do animations, media playback, or display each of the available stock colors in Flutter to help you get your apps put together even faster. The Gallery app also includes case studies, so you can see how common features work together in a big picture scenario rather than just a bunch of one-off widgets. You can see a staggered grid view, hero animations, circular animations, different types in a single list, and a few other useful items in just the screenshots here. This is great when you're trying to put together a quick prototype, as you get examples of animations and interactive components out of the box, rather than spending a bunch of your time trying to figure out how to work through solved problems from random blog posts online, Stack Overflow, or other documentation. But speaking of documentation, as you've probably noticed, I've mentioned it a lot already. I'm a huge fan of what the Flutter team has already put together, especially since a lot of it isn't just the standard, this component does something sort of stuff. One of the things that they have is the Flutter Cookbook, which is a documentation page containing various code samples, or recipes, for common tasks that you might want to do in Flutter. This is just a sample of what's there, but you can see that it's a lot of great content that you'll use in almost any app, such as animations, design elements, and networking. The next thing to talk about, plugins, are essentially a fancy word for libraries or modules, and are one of my favorite things about Flutter. Because the development community is so active and passionate about the platform, they've created thousands of open source plugins that you can use in your apps to easily accomplish tasks without having to reinvent the wheel. You can find most of these plugins by using pub.dev, a site created by Google for searching through plugins and finding their documentation and source code. So with that, let's take a look at a few useful plugins and how to implement them. While there's a ton of great third-party plugins out there, I figured I'd start with Google Maps since it's one of my favorites and my go-to when I want to display location information for my users. In this section, we'll go over the code that I used to make this exact demo image. Google Maps functionality is all wrapped by a Google Map widget that can be displayed on the screen. This widget has the bulk of its functionality handled by the onMapCreatedFuture method. If you're not familiar with features from other languages, they're basically one of the ways that Flutter handles asynchronous operations by figuring out what to do in your app before an asynchronous action, during that action, and after that action has finished. If you're familiar with Android development, then you could think of these like async task. Features will come up a few more times during this talk, though a really detailed look into this feature is a little out of the scope for this presentation. So this onMapCreated method is triggered once the maps data has finished loading. The example for this presentation will load the location of Google's offices around the world as a list of objects that will then be displayed as markers. Once those office locations are loaded, the map data structure of markers will get cleared and then we'll loop through each office. Each office will then be converted into a Google Maps marker that designates the office's location, name, and address. We can also add an action to ONTAP, such as bringing up a navigation screen or displaying additional information about a specific marker location. Finally, we'll take each marker and add it to the global map data structure that we cleared earlier. Back to the Google Map widget, we can set the initial camera position and zoom level. In this case, it'll be a very high level view that is centered in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. And finally, we can add the set of markers to be displayed on the Google Map. Next up is Flare Flutter. Flare Flutter is a third party plugin that I thought was just kind of too cool to not include in this talk. This plugin is great when you want to animate icons, buttons, or other items in your app to add some extra kick to your UI, which is always great when you're trying to sell an idea to someone or show it off for hackathon judges. It's worth noting that you can do some of this manually using native widgets like Animation Builder or Transform, but it's not nearly as easy. Using their animation website, Rive.app, you can stage out animations that will then get converted into a vector animation file that you can export and run in your app. Overall, it took me roughly 20 minutes of a tutorial on YouTube to learn how to make this fading and spinning star animation and properly set up keyframes. Luckily, once you know how to put together one animation, it's really easy to make others that can help your app stand out. Once you have your vector animation file exported, using it is as simple as initializing the custom Flare Actor widget in your app, then assigning it the animation file when you want it to run. You'll also notice that I'm listing the animation title as Go in one of the properties, which is what I called the animation in the web app before I exported it. While we've talked a lot about rapid prototyping for apps, it's becoming more and more common that people need to make prototypes that consist of an app with a hardware device. 
For this next section, I want to briefly touch on FlutterBlue, a third-party plugin that helps you communicate with Bluetooth devices using a Flutter app. While I won't go into a lot of detail here, this is an area worth knowing for people that need to make IoT prototypes, so I want to make sure that it's at least introduced. The first thing every Bluetooth app needs to do is scan for advertising devices. You can do this by calling Start Scan on a FlutterBlue instance. You can also, and probably should, set a timeout duration so the scanning stops after a period of time. Next you will listen for results to be returned from that scan, and then you can act on those results, like saving a particular device based off of its name or RSSI value, which is the received signal strength of a device. After saving your device, you will probably want to connect to it using the connect method, and then you can discover the services that are being broadcast by that Bluetooth device. Depending on your setup, you may also want to loop through each of those services to do something with them in your app. Then you can discover the services that are being broadcast by that Bluetooth device. Depending on your setup, you may also want to loop through each of those services to do something with them in your app. One thing that you might do is pull each characteristic or piece of information from the broadcast of services. Not only can you read those characteristics, but you can also asynchronously write back to your hardware device by using those characteristics. The final thing that I want to cover with FlutterBlue is that you can attach a listener to characteristics that will be notified anytime new data is pushed to a characteristic by another device. This will allow your apps to stay reactive while dealing with the real world. To wrap up our introduction to Flutter, I want to talk about one of the more common tasks you'll run into when building a new app, retrieving data from the internet and parsing a JSON payload into Dart data objects. This sample will go over a simple list app that pulls data from the Etsy API to display inventory amounts for each listing in a single shop though the same idea can be carried over to countless other common scenarios. The first thing you'll want to do is use a future builder in your app, which you may remember is a specific component in Flutter that lets you decide which widgets to show during or after loading data. So in this case, I'm using a new method called future listings. This method is asynchronous and returns a future object with the type of listings, which is a custom object that represents the array of items coming from the API. This method will use the HTTP package to get the data from our API endpoint, and if that endpoint returns a 200 success code, then we'll use the json.decode method to convert the response into a JSON object, which will then convert into a listings object. This is done from a custom object that I created called listings, using some Dart magic under the hood that converts a JSON map into a list of objects with a type of dynamic, which are essentially just undefined generics. Once we have the data from that future, we can do another conversion to switch the list of dynamic objects into another custom object, listing, which is just an individual item from the earlier listings array using similar JSON conversions. This example also sorts the list using a simple A to B comparator operator. That sorting operation isn't necessary, but it seems like something people might want to use if they're putting together something quickly and want it to look nice. After all that, you can create a new list view of list tiles just like we did earlier in this presentation. For the last part of the sample, if there isn't any data in the future builder, such as during the time data is loading, then we can just display a circular progress indicator until the results are available. It's also good practice to handle error cases in the future builder, though I didn't for this example to save a little bit of space and time. For the next part of this talk, we will learn a little bit about Firebase and how it's used with Flutter through Google's open source plugin, Flutterfire, which you can find on GitHub. So first, let's go over the official pitch for Firebase. Firebase is an application development platform with a mission to help app developers succeed by using Firebase products. Firebase accomplishes this by taking common problems and developer tasks that occur during a product's lifecycle and making them easier to solve, be it by providing more information about your apps and their performance or providing tools to handle complex problems like security and network connectivity when storing data. Firebase is divided into three main categories of tools with specific goals. Helping you build better apps by making complex coding processes easier. Improving app quality by helping you catch issues early and fixing them quickly. And helping you grow your app by understanding how other people are using it and engaging with, with them in a meaningful way. So you can see here there's almost 20 different products within Firebase. While that may seem like a lot, today we're only going to talk about a subset of all of the Firebase features that are most relevant to rapid prototyping. 
Again, the goal here isn't to overwhelm you, but rather to let you know what's available when you need it. Before you can start diving in and using Firebase in your apps, you'll need to create a new project. You can do this at console.firebase.com and basically just type in a product name and hit next a few times to get set up and into your project's console dashboard. The next step will be linking your apps back to Firebase. For this talk, I'll only touch on Android and iOS processes. For Android, you'll need to enter in the apps package name, which you can find in the androidmanifest.xml file in your project, and potentially the SHA-1 certificate for your signing key. One thing to pay attention to is that the SHA-1 certificate is optional, and I really recommend that you skip using it unless you're using one of the few products like Google Sign-In or Dynamic Links that absolutely need it. After that, you'll need to add some code into your build.gradle files for both core Firebase and the specific Firebase products that you want to use. Through the setup process, you will also be provided with a Google services.json file that will need to be copied into your Flutter app. The iOS process is similar, if not a little bit easier. You'll basically put in your bundle ID and then add some info to a plist file in your app and then install the pod files for the products that you want to use. After that's done, you should be golden for using Firebase on both iOS and Android with your Flutter app. The first feature that I want to go over is authentication. While it's not the most flashy feature, there's always going to be that one hackathon judge that asks about security, so you might as well toss it in since it's easy enough to use. Firebase authentication will allow your users to log into your app using a username and password, a phone number, a third-party identity provider like Google or Facebook, or a few other options. For simplicity, I'm only going to go over a few of the more commonly used authentication features in this talk. So let's go ahead and get started by discussing user authentication using an email and password. A major part of this setup process occurs in the console. Aside from adding your app to Firebase and updating your plist or including your Google services JSON file, you will need to enable each type of Firebase authentication that you will want to use from the Firebase auth section in the Firebase console. After project setup and enabling auth, you can get back into the code for your app. Using email and password sign-on is super easy. The first thing you will do is register your user's email and password, which you can do by calling the create user with email and password method on a Firebase auth instance. This will also automatically log the user in. If you want to sign a returning user in, you can use the sign in with email and password method just as easily. Next is email link authentication. This authentication feature takes an email address from the user and then sends them a link that they can use to sign in, proving that they have access to that email address. Just like the email and password method, you'll need to enable email link sign-in from the Firebase console. This is actually an additional option under the email and password method, so you just need to activate the appropriate slider and then click save. You will also need to enable dynamic links in the Firebase console, as these are used to associate your app with the user's email via the sent link. You may remember from a few slides ago that enabling dynamic links also means that you'll need the SHA-1 certificate added to your app in the Firebase console in order for this feature to work on Android devices. When you're ready to sign your users in, you'll need to email them a link using the send sign in with email link method while including the information for iOS or Android app packages, as well as a dynamic link for your Firebase project. If everything goes as expected, you should receive an email like the one in this screenshot that contains a sign in link for your project. Clicking in that link should open your app on the user's device. Your app will immediately call the did change app lifecycle state flutter method when opening. You can check to see if the lifecycle state is resumed, and then see if there's a dynamic link associated with the opened app. If there is, you can handle that use case. Generally, the way that you would do this is by calling Firebase Auth's sign in with email and link method to retrieve a Firebase user. And then finally, you can update the app's state data. The final auth type that I'm going to go over is Google sign in. From my own experience, this is the easiest of the third-party authentication methods to use. You will first need to instantiate the Google sign-in object, then call the sign-in method on that. If the user's device is able to use Google sign-in, then they will be prompted with a sign-in dialog similar to this. After the user has selected their account, you will receive a Google sign-in account object. You can use this to call authenticate against Google's identity provider service. Once the user is authenticated, you can retrieve their auth credentials from the Google auth provider. And finally, you can retrieve the Firebase user using their Google Authenticator credential. Additionally, if the user has been previously authenticated, you can retrieve their Firebase user using the current user method. 
Next, I want to talk about the two database options available in Firebase. The first one, Real-Time Database, uses a simple JSON tree structure to store and access data. This data is stored and synced between users and devices, and its main goal is to provide a back-end data storage solution without having to go through the whole tedious process of setting up your own database server, authentication schema, REST endpoints, and everything else that goes along with building a typical database infrastructure. The first thing you will need to do to use the Firebase real-time database is create a Firebase database object in your app. You can then create a reference to a specific node in the JSON tree data structure. In this case, that node is called messages, and it's a child of the root node. You can create as many references as you like, such as this part of the code that creates a reference to the counter node and then reads the value from it once before printing it. After you have your reference, you can associate it with the listener in order to take action on any data changes as they happen. Finally, I want to introduce a new graphical widget from the Fireflutter library called Firebase Animated List. This works like a standard list, but it will animate as items are added or removed from it, and it works specifically with Firebase references to listen for data changes without you having to tie everything together manually. If this widget doesn't work for your use cases, then there's also the Firebase List and Firebase Sorted List widgets. And for reference, this is the same screenshot from the first real-time database slide with that animated list, so you can see what it looks like with a little bit more context. The second option, Cloud Firestore, is a database tool that allows you to group data using a document collection structure for straightforward access. It offers many of the advantages of the real-time database, such as real-time syncing, offline support, and scalability, but also supports basic queries in addition to direct data access. One thing that's important to remember is that Cloud Firestore can be used in conjunction with the real-time database, as each can serve its own unique purpose within your app. Like most things in Firebase, it only takes a few lines of code to do the most common actions, like reading and writing data. By first getting an instance of the Firestore object, you can retrieve a child collection from Firestore. Once you have that collection reference, you only need one call to add a new document item to it or another call to retrieve all the documents from that collection one time. Despite those two operations being simple, let's also look at something a little bit more complicated, like listening for changes to your data. You can do this by creating a stream builder object that listens to a specific path in Firestore and updates whenever new data comes down. While we won't get too deep into what a stream builder is, you can think of it in a similar way to futures in Flutter, except that they're activated any time new data is sent to them. This object can then check to see if a data snapshot is available. If it isn't, then you can return a default UI widget. Otherwise, you can retrieve the data from that snapshot. Using that data, you can update your app's state and UI. In this case, we're using the length of a data snapshot to define how large a list view should be, and then displaying list tiles in that list using the actual documents that have come down. While we've talked about database options already, Sometimes you need to store and serve user-generated content, such as images or audio files, directly into your app. You can do this using Cloud Storage for Firebase. Uploads and downloads handled by the Cloud Storage SDK are resumable, making them more resilient to changes in network connectivity. When a user's connection is disrupted during an upload, the SDK will automatically handle retrying and resuming, which can be critical when dealing with the kinds of network conditions often encountered on mobile devices. Downloading content uses a similarly robust system, allowing users to receive their data once a connection is successfully re-established. Once the user's content is uploaded, it can be shared with other users of your app using the same SDK, and since you will likely run into situations where only certain users should be able to see or upload specific content, you can use Firebase's security rule system, along with Firebase authentication, to restrict content according to your app's requirements. When you want to upload a data object to cloud storage, you can get a reference to the storage path, and then create a storage upload task by calling put file or put data on your storage reference with the item that you want to upload, as well as any metadata that you want to associate with that item. You can also save a reference to that task in order to pause, resume, or cancel the action. Downloading a file is similarly easy. You can specify a storage reference for the file that you want and then get its download URL. Once you have that, you can pull down that file using an HTTP request like we had discussed earlier when going over the Etsy list item app. Once a response is received, you can retrieve the information about that file and then use it in your app. Cloud functions for Firebase are single-purpose functions that are executed in a secure, 
managed environment for your Firebase project. They are powerful tools that let you handle complex logical operations from within Firebase, such as performing operations on your Firebase database or interacting with various other Google or external services. These are great for handling backend logic in your app without setting up a complicated backend. To provide a quick example, I have this function written using Node that is hosted via Firebase functions. When it receives an HTTPS request, it'll get the date and respond with a hello message as well as a current timestamp. You can call that function directly using Flutterfire's HTTPS callable object with an optional data map. And then you can listen for the results asynchronously to update your app's UI. At the 2019 FireConf, we also released a new product called Extensions, which are pre-made functions that handle common tasks for developers without having to reinvent the wheel. You can find them in the console to see what can work for your app, and there's still more that will be released over time. While it's the only product that I'll talk about today that isn't in the Firebase build grouping, app distribution is great for rapid prototyping when you need to work with other people. You can upload your APK or IPA file and add either a single person or group in the console so that people can receive an email and download your app without having to go through the Play or Apple stores, and then they can give you feedback or work with your app before, if ever, it's officially released to the public. The final thing I want to talk about is Firebase ML, which allows mobile developers to enhance their app's user experience by applying machine learning. Firebase ML provides a variety of models that can run quickly from the cloud with a high level of accuracy and detail. The out-of-the-box models allow developers to recognize text, label objects, and identify landmarks. Developers can also take their custom TensorFlow models and run them through Firebase's easy-to-use APIs. Firebase ML is a little more complex than other Firebase products, but it's still not too bad. For this example, the image and image rotation parameters are found prior to running this method, and how you retrieve your image will vary depending on the needs of your app. You can find a great sample that retrieves an image using scanner utils to get the camera stream in the Flutter Fire GitHub repo. Once you have all the necessary data, you can call process image on your Firebase ML object to get everything started. The two methods here that aren't defined in this snippet are concatenate planes and rotation int to image rotation. Both of these are helper methods that you can find in the GitHub repo, but in short, they simply manipulate the image data so that it can be analyzed properly by Firebase ML. So we've covered a lot today. If you want to learn more about Flutter or Firebase in depth, then the top few links will give you a ton of information and resources like code labs and videos. For Flutter, I highly recommend checking out the Flutter cookbook that we talked about earlier, and you can find more information about all of the features available in Flutterfire on GitHub. Again, my name is Paul Reese, and thank you for watching my talk. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me on Twitter or at my email address of ptreese at google.com. Thanks.